Thank you. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Will you please state your name? Yes, it's Amber Laura Heard. And what is your address? I live in Yucca Valley, California. And how old are you, Amber? I am 36. I just celebrated. Okay. And do you have a daughter? I do. Uh, she also celebrated her birthday recently. She's one. Okay. And what is your profession? I am an actor, uh, mostly. Okay. Now, why are you here? I am here because my ex-husband is suing me uh, for an op-ed I wrote. And how do you feel about that? I, um, I st struggle to have the words. I struggle to find the words to describe how uh, painful this is. Um, this is horrible for me to sit here uh, for weeks and um, relive everything. Um, hear people that I knew, um, some well, some not. My ex-husband, with whom I shared a life. Um, speak um, about our lives in the way that they have. Um, this has been one of, the, this is the most painful and difficult thing I've ever gone through, for sure. Now, there was a trial in the UK in July of 2020 where Mr. Depp had sued the Sun newspaper and Dan Wooten. Do you recall that? Yes. Uh, and what was your level of participation in that lawsuit, in that trial? Well, I was uh, not party to that lawsuit. I was um, a witness, um, I, I suppose the primary witness, since it dealt with the truth of the relationship um, that I shared with Johnny. And what, if any, role did you have to play with respect to, for example, witness statements and testifying? Objection, compound. I said, for example. Uh, uh, overruled. I had to write, um, I think I gave seven witness statements um, under oath testimony. I sat on the stand um, for four days um, under mostly cross-examination. And up until this point, it was the hardest thing I had ever had to do. Thank you, Amber. I'm going to take you back, and if you can just tell the jury a little bit about your background. Tell us where you grew up. I come from Austin, Texas, a small town outside of Austin that you probably haven't heard of. No one has. Um, it's called Maynard. Okay. And uh, I was raised by my mother and my father, and I grew up with a little sister, although I have a big sister as well. And your little sister's name is? Uh, her name is Whit. Whit Hurd. And how, how much of an age difference is there between the two of you? Whitney and I are about one year, I think we're 16 months apart, so right next to each other. And what did your father do for a living? Uh, my father um, broke horses and did construction, had, um, he painted houses, um, and uh, hunted and fished, but that was for fun. And what did your mom do? She worked for the state of Texas. Um, let me just, since you talked about the breaking horses, can you just tell the jury what your role is in assisting your dad on that and what is involved in breaking horses? Objection leading. Can you just tell me about? Overruled. Um, you just got to stay on, basically. Uh, I, I would help him. I was more of a, a crash test dummy. You know, when you train a horse, you it, it's a wild animal. It doesn't necessarily like to be um, ridden. And uh, there are people out there um, who are crazy enough, like my dad, to pick that as a profession, I guess. And he was really good with horses. And um, 
I was the son he never had, so it was my job to, you know, stay on. And what, if anything, did you learn from your father about how to react to the horses? Well, with training horses, um, I guess the key, the, the key things are to not show fear, not get intimidated, not show fear, be tough and calm. Tell the jury a little bit about your educational background during those growing up years and your work experience. Uh, I, I worked uh, any job that I could from the time I was really young. I wanted to get out of Texas and do something with my life and see things and do things. Um, so I was in school and really pushed myself to I just always pushed myself to um, be able to accelerate the process. I wanted to, you know, get out of school as fast as I could, and I wanted to do, I wanted to do more things with my life than stay in Texas. So, what types of things? So, where did you go to school when you were um, younger? I was a scholarship kid at a Catholic school um, growing up. Uh, several different Catholic schools, but they were always in the other, you know, on the other side of town, in the wealthier part of town, and um, I grew up quite um, working class, and uh, and and thankfully, with um, you know, as long as I maintained an A average, I, uh, I I enjoyed the benefit of a scholarship, and I did that until I realized that I could take my GED and SATs early, and I did that and placed out of school and effectively left school uh, at 16 years old, I believe. And what did you do for work during those younger years? I took any job that I could. I worked at my father's construction company, sometimes, um, you know, just administrative stuff. I mean, it was a small company. Um, but I answered phones and I uh, worked at a, like a modeling agency that was also you know, um, offered photography classes, makeup classes, hair, hair and makeup classes for people that were pursuing a career in entertainment. And I uh, started taking um, classes that I paid for by working there effectively as a trade. Uh, and I eventually worked there long enough to be able to pay for my headshots, which are the pictures that you use in the industry to promote yourself, you know, in, in whatever acting modeling or both okay and <clears throat> what if any charitable work did you do when you were still young it started off as a, a requirement for the school I went to and then I liked it so much I think because it it meant I wasn't at home and that was important to me is just to not spend time at home uh, and I um, I really I really loved meeting people, so I worked at the soup kitchen every morning before school, um, during the school year, uh, for about four years. There were, I didn't go on weekends, um, but on weekends I would do um, various things, worked at children's, um, like at children's uh, museums typically, because they would work with younger volunteers. Um, and mostly soup kitchens and things involving children. I worked at the um, with deaf kids for a while, and uh, yeah, I I love it. And when you worked with deaf kids, what if anything did you do to learn to be able to work with them? Objection leading and four hundred four. And relevance, Your Honor. Overruled. Um, well, I I taught myself how to sign basic sign language and then I um, I pursued it I audited a, uh, a translate um, a course at the community college which I ended up going to um, to get out of high school early um, later on but I would audit classes the teachers never wanted to kick the you know random 12 year old out of their class I suppose so I remarkably was able to audit uh, um, I think the majority of two semesters and that's also help, help me learn. <laughs> so how did you end up in Los Angeles? 
I use, I met, I did a, I did a small job in Texas uh, where I played a part in a movie and the actor in the movie that I was playing opposite had an agent visiting him from LA and I met her on set and she said that she had heard about me from another bit part I did. You know, I was taking jobs in Austin for really anything, to be an extra, to apply my, I did makeup once. I, um, you know, nothing, no job was too small or, you know, for me. So I, I put myself out there and she had heard about me and she said, I have heard about you in this town and I'd love to meet you in LA if you're ever out in LA and I was like, um, oh, when can I come? Uh, and she made an appointment with me for the following week and I used all but $180 or something um, to get out there and that's, I landed, I didn't know anyone. Uh, I was 17 um, and I've effectively ever been there ever since, I suppose. So when you arrived in Hollywood, please tell the jury what you did to get moving there, get going. I uh, went to every audition, every casting, every meeting, every appointment that I could. I, I put myself out there. I didn't have a car um, because those were expensive. Um, so I took the bus around LA. It was before smartphones. I had a, a Thomas guide in my bag and a change of tank tops. Um, not that it mattered, but I went to about 10 auditions sometimes a day and would change clothes if I needed to in the back of you know the bus I was taking. And I just hustled from one audition to the other. And uh, I got a bit part on one thing and then I got a bit part on another thing. And then eventually m my roles kind of became more important or bigger and um, it's been a slow progression, I guess, since then, you know, of doing either tiny bit parts in bigger movies or doing, you know, larger roles in movies that no one would see. And I guess, you know, it still is kind of like that. So I'm going to ask you to go from 2002 to 2009. If you could just describe for the jury a little bit what types of parts you had, um, I think, They've indicated they didn't. You you have not been well known here uh, in this courtroom compared to Mr. Depp. So perhaps just take them through a little bit of that. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I did small roles in big films like you know, Zombie Land and um, Pineapple Express and uh, movies that were well known. Um, my first one was Friday Night Lights, uh, but again, I had small roles in those bigger films. And then I would do larger roles in um, kind of s smaller films. Like I brought, um, I did a project where I was the lead in a John Carpenter film and he came out of retirement to do that. And that's kind of the, how it was in terms of my career for those initial, that, that first initial 10 years or so. It was just going from slightly bigger role to slightly bigger role and was working my butt off. So I'm going to take you up to 2008. Did there come a time that you auditioned for The Rum Diary? Yes, I, um, I auditioned for that in about 2008, I believe. Please describe for the jury your experience in auditioning for The Rum Diary. Well, I auditioned a few times, which is common in my work. You know, um, you get a call back, as they say. And I think I had um, at least one, maybe two callbacks with the director and then I got a call saying that Johnny, who at the time was, I think I knew that he was producing it as well, um, was doing a project that was something very personal to him. He was reprising his role as his late friend, Hunter S. Thompson, and it was a very important project to him and that he wanted to meet me in person. Um, I thought I would be going for maybe an audition. Um, but it was just a meeting. I went to his office um, and, and met with him for a few hours. And what did you talk about during that, those few hours? We talked about books and music, poetry. Um, we like a lot of the same, we liked a lot of the same stuff, you know, obscure writers and 
you know, interesting books and pieces of poetry that I haven't heard anybody else reference or know or like. And he um, was very well read and charismatic. And, she, you know, I think I left the office with a few books that he gave me. And we spent the whole time just talking about things that we care about. And I was. I was so surprised that somebody, you know, I knew who he was. I wasn't familiar, you know, I wasn't a fan of his work. I wasn't familiar with him, but I knew who he was. You know, he's mo one of the most famous people in the world. So it was al already a weird thing to go and get called into his office. And, you know, I'm a no-name actor. I was 22, I think, and I thought it was unusual. <laughs> it was weird because he's... It was, twice my age and he's this world famous actor and here we are getting along about obscure books and weird you know old blues and we just it was I thought it was remarkable you know I just hadn't really I thought it was unusual and remarkable I left there just feeling like wow so did there come a time that you learned that you were going to be cast for the role in The Rum Diary? Yes. A few days later, my agent um, said that Johnny's going to call you. We gave him your phone number. I was like, oh, okay. And shortly after, I my phone rings. I pick it up, and I hear, you know, this, like, deep voice on the other line. And he said, you got the, you know, you, you're it, kid. You're the... You're the dream. Hunter wrote this part, and you're the dream. You're it, kid. Like, and means. please describe for the jury what that means. What what was the, the Rome Diary and this Hunter Thompson? What what was the concept here, and what role were you playing? Um, well, it was my understanding that he was bringing to life a, his late friend, and what he told me was that this character is supposed to be the dream woman, like the dream, American dream. And um, so I knew what he meant. He indicated to me when he told me I got the role that I was, I was that, you know, that he, I was the dream kid. That's what he said. So did there come a time that you started filming The Rum Diary? Yes, I'm not quite sure how much I think we started filming in maybe March of 2009. And where did you film The Rum Diary? We shot it in Puerto Rico. Okay. Um, and describe, if you can, the events of the filming and your interactions with Mr. Depp during that time. It was a bit surreal, you know, uh, filming in a place like Puerto Rico. It was beautiful. Um, it takes place in the 50s, so everything really looked beautiful, you know, cars and clothing, the music, it was just, it was a very colorful um, shoot in general. I, I, I couldn't have asked for, you know, a, a, a better scenario. I, I, I was on, on film, I mean, I was on set um, reading my books and every, occasionally Johnny would talk to me and then he started to be really kind to me, uh, m like more open with me uh, when we'd have hot days filming, it, you know, there'd be this big SUV pull up and a security guard would kind of usher me into this car and it would have the AC blasting and I'd be <laughs> sitting in the back of the SUV just thinking what a strange experience the whole thing was. And, you know, we didn't really have a whole lot of interaction on set until um, until we did a scene that involved um, kissing. We, we had a kissing scene and it didn't feel like a normal, it didn't feel like a normal scene anymore. It felt, a, it felt more real. There are certain things that you do in the job to um, be professional, like when you have to do that sort of scene and you don't like you <laughs> you don't use your tongue if you can't if you can avoid it there's certain things that you do to just maintain a certain line and it just felt like those lines were blurred I mean he 
grabbed my face and pulled me into him and really kissed me. Did, but we were filming a scene. Did he use his tongue? Yes. Okay. Did your birthday, did you celebrate your birthday while you were in Puerto Rico? I did. I celebrated, I think, maybe my 23rd birthday there. And what, if anything, did Mr. Depp do for your birthday? Well, we were already kind of talking about books and poetry and things like that. He gave me a few really beautiful poetry books. And uh, he gave me a bicycle, uh, like a vintage bicycle, because at the time I was riding around in, on a bike. And I had a lot of time off since I was a smaller role in the movie. And, um, yeah, I think that was it. Okay. Now, did there come a time that um, you ended up visiting him in his trailer? Yes, um, I think there was a, we would hang out if, you know, after or in between scenes or in between setups, we often were, you know, talking about things and would continue the conversation into the trailer, um, often with the director, Bruce Robinson was his name. Um, and then at one point, we, we talk about wine. It's another thing that Johnny and I shared in common, a love for uh, wine, red wine. Uh, and we were talking about um, a kind of wine that I enjoyed, and I was you know, going on about how great this bargain wine was. And I didn't understand you know, how much more sophisticated Johnny's taste in wine was. Um, so I was going on about the virtues of Malbec or something, and I brought him a bottle of this wine and I set it down and at some point I'm, I'm, I'm going back to get back to set and he kind of kicked his like, you know, foot up in the air and basically kind of lifted the back of my bathrobe up and... Can I just stop you there? Why were you wearing a bathrobe? Because I was doing a scene, um, it was a period film so it uh, took place in the 50s and so I had all of this um, old undergarments that are for that time era um, on. And the scene involved me changing. Um, so I had all the, the costume on. And he kind of picked up the back of my robe with his boot. And I kind of turned around and like laughed, like giggled, you know. Um, it, I wasn't, I didn't feel I just didn't, like, I didn't know what to make of it at the time, and it just kind of, I just kind of giggled and batted it away playfully, and uh, he he kind of playfully kind of pushed me down on this, like, bed sofa uh, that was in his trailer, just playful um, and flirtatious, and he said, uh, yum, and he kind of, like, lifted up his eyebrows like that, and I just giggled, l laughed it off, kind of batted him away, and, you know, moved on, went back to set. And were you in a relationship at that time? I was. Okay. And was Mr. Depp in a relationship at that time? That was my understanding, yeah. Okay. Uh, and did anything else of significant happen during that, that time period while you were filming with Mr. Depp, other than what you've told us? We just had this... You know, it, it was a friendship, flirtatious thing. We, I felt chemistry. I felt this other thing that was that went beyond the pale of my job, for sure. Uh, Johnny clearly felt that way about me. Had indicated to me that that's how he felt in many different ways. And but at the same time, that's. You know, we were both in relationships, and it is a job, and, you know, I, it was intimidating. And I, I just remember feeling kind of intimidated and a little nervous about that. And I also was in a relationship, so we went our separate ways, and we didn't hear, I didn't hear from him for a long time. And, and that's, so approximately how long were you filming in Puerto Rico for The Rome Diary? A few months is my best All guess. right, and when you left Puerto Rico in the filming, when is the next time that you had any contact from Mr. Depp? And contact could include a anything, uh, uh, communications, written communications, uh, as well as uh, telephone or otherwise. 
uh, we had no contact until uh, Johnny called me on the phone one day and I was driving and he invited me over to his home in, in California, I mean, Beverly Hills. And I, um, I was out of the blue. I didn't even have his phone number. Um, so I was, it was quite unexpected. Uh, he called me a second time, but I, I don't think we actually connected or we didn't stay on the phone um, because we didn't, well, yeah, we didn't really speak. But the first time was the only time I actually spoke to him and he invited me over to his house uh, under kind of the, he said that, you know, we could get Bruce, who was the director, uh, to come over, something about the movie, but it was clearly not about the movie. If you know what I mean, it was, so I said, um, I, I said, my friends are in town uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm busy with that and kind of hung up feeling really startled, you know, that didn't know what else to do. What if any gifts did Mr. Depp send you during that time period after you filmed The Rum Diary? Uh, he sent me several gifts. He sent me a beautiful dress, uh, one that I wore in the movie. Uh, with a beautiful handwritten note said happy wrapping and um, made a reference to the dress being wrapping paper. Uh, he sent me a few gorgeous, expensive, what I can only assume are expensive, um, collectible books, uh, items. Uh, and then when I was away filming on a different, you know, a different job, he uh, attempted or he did send me um, some guitars. Uh, I know one delivery, I was informed about one delivery um, and I, my partner at the time uh, intercepted the, the, the attempt to, to deliver and called me immediately and said, what should I do? And I said, well, send, I said, send it back. And she did. And sh she indicated that there was, at the time that there was another one that had already previously attempted delivery and it was also rejected. We sent it, I sent it back because I wasn't there and I wouldn't have accepted it anyway. Okay. Did there come a time that you ended up having to go on a press tour for the Rum Diary? We, I got a call for the Rum Diary press tour in the fall of 2011. So that's close to two, two and a half years after you filmed? Um, I'm an actress, not a mathematician for a reason, <laughs> roughly, yes. Okay. And um, could you please describe for the jury what a press tour is? Just explain it to them. Well, you take a, a movie once it's completed, and uh, if it doesn't have distribution, you, as part of the promotion of that movie, you go to these various places, normally cities um, like London or New York, and you do press events in those cities to kind of promote the film. And you go to place to place talking about the film. And so you were then called to participate in the press tour for The Rum Diary? Uh, yes, I had um, just, I was going, I had just finished going through the process of a separation with my former partner. And I was moving and going through that. And I got a phone call saying, Remember that movie you did in Puerto Rico? Well, they want you for the press tour. And I said, well, perfect timing. Uh, <laughs> and we did that, I think, October, late October 2011. Okay. So describe for the jury your interactions with Mr. Depp during the press tour. Well, on the first stop of the, well, first stop, the beginning of the tour was Los Angeles, where we both li lived. And we did a press day normal press day and then at the end of it uh, I was invited uh, by Johnny to come up to his room to have a drink with uh, him and the director uh, of the film and I went up to the room um, to see both him and Bruce um, but as soon as I got there Johnny said Bruce wasn't going to make it so I stayed Johnny and I started talking uh, I told, he asked me about my relationship. I said, well, you know, I'm going, I'm going through it. Um, I'm going through the separation right now and it's been, you know, rough couple of months, but that's normal. And he said, well, that's same with, same with me. You know, it's been 
I can't remember exactly how long he said it had been, but that he had split from the mother of his kids and uh, said that he understood. All right, and then what happened next? Uh, then we drank red wine and continued to talk, and the talking became us, you know, reconnect. You know, it was like reconnection was almost instant. Um, it was just chemistry it's hard to explain that but we sat on the couch and we talked and um you know it, it felt like there was uh it, it felt like there was an electricity to the room and that's how I felt when I was alone with him anyway and it was instant again I was like whoa so uh on the on the couch we we talked finished some wine and then I got up and left and as I went to leave uh, he grabbed both sides of my face, uh, similar to what he did in 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 Puerto Rico when we were filming that that scene. And he kissed me, and I kissed him back. And what happened next with respect to any relationship with Mr. Depp? Well, then we fell in love. Uh, we went on this press tour, and we went. It, it, it was. It was a beautiful and strange time. You know, we went from, we we're flying from one, not together, but, you know, going from one city to the next, Europe, um, New York, Los Angeles, as I said, and we're just traveling around talking about this movie that we did together, that we participated in together, and we were falling in love. I mean, it was just, you know, at the first dinner in London, he s sat me next to him. You know, he produced the film and was a part of, controlling the film and was responsible for different things than I was as a small, as an actor having a small part in it. And um, we went on this press tour and I think in London he sat, had me sat next to him at this, at a dinner and then we ended up spending the night together in my hotel room. And for the rest of the press tour we were, it, it was on, I, I'll put it that way. All right. And how long approximately did the press tour go? I don't know exactly how long it lasted. Uh, I think, you know, there were press engagements in this city for a few days and then another city for a few days. And then there was a break and then, then there was another press opportunity, I believe. So it was kind of spread out over, a, over maybe a month, if I'm guessing. So when you returned to Los Angeles, what, if anything, took place with any relationship with Mr. Depp? Well, once we were back from the press tour, you know, we had this, you know, whirlwind romance kind of just in these, like, beautiful places all over, and we're falling in love and not able to really show it because um, he wasn't, that the world didn't know about the split between he and his former partner. And of course, um, as a woman, I was like, is that troubling? You know, and I, I'd ask him, he, no, you know, he swore to me that they hadn't even shared a bed for a year and that they were, but they were protecting the kids and not publicizing it. So, or not making it known to the press. And so we kind of had to be a little bit under the radar, not a little bit, we had to be really under the radar um, because, as Johnny pointed out, that the world would blame me um, and call me a homewrecker, uh, even though I had nothing to do with it. So we were secretly dating, and then, you know, it was it was it was beautiful. It it was um, I felt like this man knew me and saw me in a way that no one else had. I felt he understood me. I felt he understood where I came from. I, I felt like, I felt that, like, when I was around Johnny, I felt like the most beautiful person in the whole world. You know, it made me feel seen, made me feel like a million dollars. And that kind of feeling where, you know, he just, lavish gifts and lavish expressions of love and how he had never met a woman like me. I mean, I remember he took, 
the foil off of the off of this uh, bottle and put it on my ring finger. And I had only been with him like days, you know, or maybe maybe it was weeks at the time. Yeah, it was probably about a few weeks, but it just felt very intense. But we weren't doing normal life stuff. We weren't like stuck in traffic with each other. We weren't going to the grocery store and doing life. We were like hiding in these places around the world. He had a lot of, he has so many homes. And so we'd be in one of those homes or my home at the time. And it would be like a bubble, like a, in, like we were in this little bubble of secrecy and it felt like a warm glow, as we would say. Just music and, and, and the kind of books that we both loved and poetry that we both knew by heart. And it, it was, um, it felt like an, it felt like a, a dream. It felt like <laughs> absolute magic. So while you're dating, I take it you're dating at this point, right? Yes. So while you're, falling, while you're fall, yeah. falling in love, you're also dating, right? Okay. Yes. Um, did there come a time early on that you ended up going to his Bahamas Island? Yes. Uh, so shortly after, you know, we, I think started dating October of 2011. And, um, the, you know, as I mentioned, this bubble, you know, where he'd come over to my house and not leave for like three or four days, you know, just smoking cigarettes and playing music and reading poetry to me or painting me or, you know, just talking. Um, and then he would disappear. And there'd be just no way to get a hold of him, no way to contact him. At, at first, I didn't really think anything about it, but um, he disappeared uh, at one point uh, and then came back and said he was dealing with something, some health issue, and uh, would I join him in the Bahamas? And that I think that's when I learned he had an island. And I was on a trip with a, a friend of mine in Spain, and I, it was for the holidays, and I kind of rerouted my trip to so I could come and land in L.A. instead of, I mean, landing in Miami instead of L.A. so I could go and meet him on the island. And he had uh, Keenan come and meet me on that um, on that trip, like in in Miami. I get off one plane, get onto another, and go and join him on his private island, and. Uh, I noticed he was drinking Beck's and uh, tea, like lots of tea, like lots of tea. Uh, and I, I didn't foolishly think anything of it. Um, I just, you know, thought the man really seriously, I missed it before, but really, really loves tea. And we had this beautiful, I don't know, less than a week probably, um, trip in, in the Bahamas, a private island, beautiful sandy beaches. Scene, like, it's a scene that you just don't, I had never experienced anything like that. Um, it was a beautiful place, a beautiful time. And uh, we fell, um, I fell head over heels in love with this man. So after the Bahamas, I assume you came back and we're talking, are we talking now early 2012? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So what were you doing work-wise while you were dating him in this early stage? What I always do, I would be taking job to job to job, going from one movie to the next, um, mostly not filming in L.A. So weirdly, you live in L.A. To, to go shoot on location in other places. So when I was in town, we would go back to this bubble, like insular bubble with beautiful blaringly loud music and no one else and nothing else and then you know I'd, I'd go off to to work uh and so would he uh, well eventually yeah he left to shoot Lone Ranger I believe okay now we've heard a little bit about Lone Ranger and that that's about mid 2012 is that right when he was shooting that that sounds right mid 2012 yeah and were you shooting anything at that time I was shooting, um, uh, 
Machete Kills? I believe I was shooting Machete Kills in Austin. I had a small part in a Robert Rodriguez film that shot in Austin. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think Johnny was shooting and then having some time off and there was just a lot of travel, a lot of movement. So, okay. and, and so what, if any, visiting did you do with Johnny while he was on his set for Lone Ranger and where was he? Well, he was filming all over the Southwest and at some point I came to visit him and uh, on one of his locations and I would stay in the house because I couldn't really... You know, occasionally I would leave with his security guards, but I, I didn't really have anything to do but visit him for a few days. So I'd cook and um, kind of stay at home and paint or whatever and wait for him to come home and have dinner ready. And um, it, it was, we would have these little bubbles, but kind of scattered throughout the Southwest and, as he was filming. And at the time, um, Johnny had, you know, when I first arrived at one of these locations, it was the first time that Johnny told me, that he had had a health issue, uh, something with his liver, and that he wasn't, um, it, that's why he was not drinking. Um, he was drinking a lot of tea, like a lot of tea. Okay, and so uh, we've heard a little testimony about boots. What, if anything, did you do to help Johnny with his boots? Well, I mean, I, um, I suppose that I took off his boots uh, and it made an impression on him and I would I was happy to you know anything I can do to to show love um, certainly how I felt about him but if he wanted to take off his own boots he, he certainly could did you buy mr. Depp any knives during that time period objection leading sustained what if any uh, what if anything did you do with respect to knives during the time period you were with him in the Lone Ranger objection leading what if anything overruled I uh, Johnny had a thing for turquoise and uh, that eventually you know being in the Southwest it happens really it can happen really quickly I also too really love turquoise and he has a um, he loved knives. He loves a lot of things. When Johnny loves things, he does it a lot, and you know, lots of it. Uh, so he had these daggers that he had given me that really, they were beautiful in design. Um, and uh, they're, you know, long, curved daggers. Uh, and he just talked a lot about knives, had a knife and gun collection. Uh, and was quite proud of it. And at some point, I, I don't really remember exactly when it was, but I, at some point I picked up a, what I thought was a really beautiful turquoise-handled um, knife. And I uh, had it engraved with a saying um, that Johnny would say to me all the time, uh, which I, you know, thought was romantic, as funny as that is to say now. And what was the expression, the saying? Uh, until death, uh, um, hasta la muerte in Spanish. Now, by the time that you're visiting Mr. Depp in uh, during his shooting of uh, Lone Ranger in the June through August 2012 time frame, uh, what, if any, relationship has he developed with your family? Oh, well, starting really early on, Johnny was so kind so generous to my family, but especially, especially my mom and dad, he just really, he met my dad and um, my dad's a big personality. Uh, he's, a, he's a rowdy guy. And uh, Johnny just all of a sudden, I had never noticed, you know, Johnny have a Southern, all of a sudden Johnny had the Southern accent and was really like buddy buddies with him. And they really seemed to get along very well. There, you know, just like instantly, he was giving my dad gifts. He gave him guns. He gave him knives. They had this. I mean, Johnny just really just showered my dad. And my dad's a, a working man, you know, um, salt of the earth guy. And he was just like, you know, floored. He's getting all these amazing gifts and being invited to come on to these locations. And you know, Johnny's this big movie star, and my dad was just like. You know, I think my dad would have married him himself, not <laughs> if I hadn't. And he just instantly, 
He gave my mom jewelry, brought her out to come and see me while I was visiting Johnny uh, on, on Lone Ranger in, in some part of the Southwest. I think it was Colorado. He gave her this beautiful turquoise necklace. And I mean, that, yeah, they were, they were definitely um, taken by him. And what, if any, uh, relationship had Mr. Depp forged with Whitney by this time, your sister? I believe the relationship came a little bit later as they got to know each other, but he did the same thing with my sister and just really found um, a bond with with them that, you know, was... It, it was, you know, he, he tried to do anything and everything he could for to make them feel like special and they did you know my mom my dad and my sister and what if any relationships did mr depp form with your friends well johnny's so generous and can be this really like overly generous almost you know like showering you with gifts and compliments and just i mean like, you know, and he has access and means to really, you know, we're not talking about giving you a card. We're like talking about just these like extravagant trips or these extravagant gestures. And it's, it's a lot. And he's, he did that with my close friends. I'm relied heavily on, on my, on my friends and had a pretty strong support network with them. And he really just showered, showered them with generosity and love and, light and invited them to come to these exotic places and flew people here and there. I mean, he's incredibly, incredibly generous. So going back to the filming of the Lone Ranger, what if anything did Mr. Depp do with respect to a horse? Objection leading. What if anything? Overruled. Okay. Uh, Johnny at one point insisted on buying me a horse. And I, of course, said that's ex extravagant. I, there's no way I could accept that. That's how, also, how will I take care of that horse? You know, it's just it's so extravagant. So I said, no, of course. Eventually, he got a hold of my dad and worked it out with my dad, like what kind of horse to buy, and then showed me a picture of this horse and said, it's yours. It's, it's, it's coming here. I think it was being transported. And he said, you know, that he had my dad's help on it, picking out. And, you know, I grew up on, on my dad's horses. You know, I grew up riding with my dad. So, you know, I, I went, I had, I had um, resisted for, I think about like a month and a half or something of him kind of bringing up the idea and me saying, that's, a crazy gift. No, thank you. No, that's incredibly generous, but I couldn't accept to all of a sudden I had a cult. So, um, so let's, let's take you through 2012 and your relationship. Could you just describe for the jury a little bit about how that relationship evolved through 2012? It was always intense. It didn't become intense. It almost started that way. Um, I, when I was with him, you know, I, I felt that electricity in my body. I felt like butterflies that couldn't, you know, I couldn't see straight practically. It was just, you know, I had, I, was head over heels in love and he felt like that to me he he felt like he was also in love I didn't feel like he was faking it I, I felt like we, what we had it felt like to me at the time there wasn't any love like that you know I mean and then uh, he would he started to kind of do this thing again where he'd disappear and he'd come back. And I remember it, at first he would, when he first started drinking, I didn't really think much of it, but all of a sudden the behavior kind of started to go in line with the disappearing and he'd come back and he'd just be different. 
And I, I'd say something and he'd accuse me of saying something else or saying it in a different way or he would, um, it was mostly my clothing at the time and me working, that was the main thing. Like I found myself trying to not talk about auditions because it was, it would change the mood so dramatically. I, I tried to, you know, he would make these comments about, you know, pouring myself out, but do so in the context of me acting, you know, and he would talk about other actresses who do my role in this way where they were worthless whores, that they were, they were, you know, uh, uh, fame hungry, you know, expletive, expletive, you know, just this, the point is it felt really dirty to be an actor. It, never mind that he was one. It was more, it was dirty that I wanted to do this job that I wanted to do and I was doing the job of an actress. It was everything I, every time I was walking out of the house, I, he would ask me, that's really what you're wearing, kid? Oh, I see. You know, I, I wore a dress to an event once and I felt, I felt beautiful in it. <laughs> like, stupid as that sounds, I, I felt pretty in this dress I picked out and I showed it him because I, you know, it's a carpet, it's red carpet, so it's like, you know, pu publicized. And I kind of thought it was weird. He didn't, wasn't saying anything about it. You know, I left him to go do this red carpet, and I was like, "Did you see the the, you know, the event I went to? You know, basically, I just I, I, I felt pretty, and I thought, like, did you see that? You know, I wanted him to say something about that, I guess." And, um, and he said, well, this is after he stopped talking to me for some time, didn't tell me why. When he came back into my life, he wouldn't explain why he was acting different. He just kind of acted mad at me, didn't know what I had done wrong. And when I brought up the dress and the event, because it was an event to support a charity I was really involved with at the time, and... I said, you, you know, did you see that thing? And he said, yeah, yeah, I think the whole world saw that kid. That's how they'll remember you. That's how the world will remember you. And I was like, oh, come on. I mean, it's like, but it, you know, I felt, I felt good in it. I felt good. And he said, yeah, kid, that's what you're putting out there in the world. No one will ever forget that. And that's all they'll see you as. That's what you, that's what you wanted. That's what you were going for. You know, my dress was low cut. I get it. It's low cut. But I felt, um, you know, uh, I felt really embarrassed and horrible that I wore that. I felt like, how could I have made that choice? Of course, you know, he's right. You know, you start to believe it. I, I started to believe that, that that made a lot of sense, of course. Um, but it didn't stop with that. It was just, it, it was clothing in general. And when I walked out of the house, it was never, it wasn't just like, hey, you're not allowed to wear that. It was like, oh, really? That's what you're wearing. No wonder. No wonder you get cast in those roles. No wonder you, 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 that's what you are. That's what you're making it. And it just, it, you know, it continued. And then, then there would be a blow up. And at first it was just to throw something, smash some things. Um, it loves to smash up a, a place, an apartment, furniture. That's what it started with, um, glass threw a glass at me, and I remember it was summer. Um, and he just threw this glass across the kitchen, and I, it didn't hit me, but I, I, it shattered behind me, and I remember thinking that it like very easily could have hit me. And that, calling me a whore, all, it didn't start with using the whore word, it was just comments, um, until it would escalate. And then I started to notice the pattern of escalation where he'd throw glass or turn over a table. Then he would hit the wall and then he'd hit the wall really close to my head. You know, like when I'm standing there, you know, just hit the wall screaming at me. Um, but then he would um, disappear and get clean and sober and he'd come back and tell me that he, had, he was done drinking, he was over it. It's done, cleaned himself up. He had done it before and he'd do it again. And then he would go back to this like wonderful, like 
almost like just unreal, like real, you know, but un unbelievably nice, sensitive, kind, warm, generous, interesting, funny man that I loved. And he would make me feel so loved. Like it would get, I would feel so distant from that thing that was so scary that I would not even recognize the two. And that was how, you know, our relationship kind of started to develop in that first year. Do you remember the first time that he physically hit you? Yes. Please tell the jury about it. <sighs> it was so, it's seemingly so stupid, so in, like insignificant. I will never forget it. It changed, it changed my life. I was sitting on the couch and we were talking, we were having a, like a normal conversation, you know, just, there was no fighting, no argument, nothing. And um, he was drinking and um, I didn't realize at the time, but I think he was using cocaine because it was like there was a jar, a jar of cocaine out on the table. I, re I realize that sounds weird, but it's like a, an actual vintage jar of it. But I didn't see him use it at the time, so I, I didn't really factor that in. I just, you know, he's drinking and we're talking and it's there's music playing and he's smoking cigarettes and we're sitting next to each other on the couch. And I ask him about the tattoo he has on his arm. And to me, it just looked like um, black marks. It, like I didn't know, I didn't know what it said. It just looked like muddled, faded tattoo that was hard to read. And I said, what, is it, what does it say? And he um, said, it says, why no? It says, why no? And I, um, I didn't see that. I thought he was joking uh, because it didn't look like it said that at all. And I laughed. It was that simple. Um, I, I just laughed because I thought he was joking. And slapped me across the face. And I laughed. I laugh because I I didn't know what else to do. I thought, this must be a joke. This must be a joke. Because I'm, I didn't know what was going on. I just stared at him, kind of laughing still, thinking that he was going to start laughing too to tell me it was a joke. But he didn't. He said, you think it's so funny? You think it's funny, bitch. You think you're a funny bitch. And he slapped me again. Like, it was clear it wasn't a joke anymore. And I stopped laughing, but I didn't know what else to do. You know, you... I, 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 you, I didn't know what to do. You, you would think you, you would have a response, but I, as a woman, had never been hit like that. I'm an adult and I'm sitting next to the man I love and he slapped, he slapped me for no reason it seemed like and I missed the point. It was that stupid. Second slap, I know he's not kidding but I don't know what else to say or do so I just stared at him. I didn't say anything. I didn't react. I didn't move or freak out or defend myself or, or say, what are you doing? You're crazy. I just stared at him because I didn't know what else to do. And he slaps me one more time hard. I lose my balance. Um, at this point, we're sitting next to each other at the, on the edge of the couch, or I was on the edge of the couch. And I'm all of a sudden realizing that the worst thing has just happened to me that could possibly happen to you. I realized that I, I wish so much he had said he was joking because it didn't hurt didn't physically hurt me. I was just sitting there on this, on, on this carpet, looking at the dirty carpet, wondering how I wound up on this carpet and why I was never, why I never noticed that the carpet was so filthy before and I just didn't know what else to do. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to react. I just sat there thinking, how much time do I have till I figure out what I need to do because God, did he just hit me? 
no, I didn't want to leave him. I didn't want this to be the reality. I didn't want to have the man I was in love with. I know you don't come back from that. You know, I'm not dumb. I, I know you can't hit a woman. I, you can't hit a man. You can't hit anyone. You can't just hit somebody because they... I knew there was no... I knew it was wrong, and I knew that I had to leave him. And that's what broke my heart because I didn't want to leave him. I thought if I got up out of that room, I would leave the best thing that ever happened to me. And I wish I could sit here and say I stood up and I walked out of that house and I drew a line and I stood up for myself. But I was just looking at the dirty carpet trying to will myself to get up, to walk out of the door because I knew I needed to. And I really slowly, I stood up and I remember looking at him in the eye and just looking at him, frankly, because I didn't know what else to do. And before I know it, he starts crying. And you know, like I, I had never seen an adult man cry. Um, I didn't even really see my dad cry at my grandma's funeral. You know, it's just, it's weird. And he's crying. Uh, tears, I mean, just falling out of his eyes. He gets down on his knees and he grabs my hands and he's touching my hands and he's saying to me, I will never do that again. I'm so sorry, baby. I, I put the fucker away. I thought I killed it and it's, it's done. I, 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 I thought I put the monster away and I've done it before. It's done. But on his knees. And I... I, I, I didn't have words. I didn't know what to say. I just remember thinking that it was just, he was crying. He seemed so sorry, but I knew I couldn't just forgive him because I, right? That, that means it will happen again, no? You know, like I've seen the health class videos like everyone else. And I got up in my car. I walked to the car. I didn't say anything. I made a point to not say, oh, it's okay, or anything like that. I just didn't say anything. I got up, I went to the car, I sat in my car, and I felt like I sat there forever. I didn't want to turn the key. I just leaned my head up against the window, and I remember just seeing my breath on the, on the windshield, you know, on the, the glass of the, uh, of the window of the door, just seeing my breath and trying to will myself, to have the strength to know what I should do in this moment because I was heartbroken. And I sat there for a long time and I eventually turned the key and drove home. And what did you do after that? I don't know, I, I don't remember what I did when I got home. I don't remember, um, I went to my therapist. I told her. Objection hearsay. I, um, I'll sustain it as to what she may have told her. I um, went home and I, um, a few days later, I uh, started getting, I actually don't know how many days later, but I started getting calls and texts from Johnny, um, you know, uh, apologizing profusely. I mean, just, you know, he was, he said, I'd rather cut my hand off than ever lay it on you or lay it upon you, you know, and he had that way of talking. It felt like poetry. And uh, he showed up to talk. Like, with the understanding that, you know, he understood I could never forgive him and it was done. So I felt kind of safe and saying, okay, let's have a talk. Or, you know, yeah, we'll talk. I, I, I think, I, you know, I, I know I just wanted to see him. And he comes over, brings me gifts. He brought me a couple of cases, actually, of that Vega Cecilia wine that we've heard about. Um, which is a really nice, expensive wine that I could never at that time, a dream of affording, you know, um, 
and we talk and he tells me that he had put this thing away, that I could trust him, that it would never happen again. Of course, it would never happen again. That he'd put this thing away, he'd killed the fucker is what he said to me over and over again. I put that fucker away, I killed that monster. I'll kill it again, it's done. I'll never lay a hand on you again. And I wanted to believe him, so I chose to. Chose to stay in the relationship. Yeah, I did. I I believed it. But, you know, I believed it wouldn't. I believed that there was a line he wouldn't cross again, and that was it. And so you stayed, correct? You stayed in the relationship? Yes. Okay. So just, is this a good time? You no, want to you break? keep going. It's a little longer. Please. Okay. Thank you. So could you please describe for the jury um, the evolution of your relationship after that time with Johnny? Um, I don't... <clears throat> I don't know how long it was until things got bad again. Uh, he did start drinking again. Uh, I remember the, it was, it was almost, you know, he start drinking again, the disappearing thing, the coming back, he'd come back at ran, like in the middle of the night to my house. Um, and he, it would be unclear to me, you know, drunk, often really drunk and kind of accusing me, but not directly. It was nothing was very direct. It was a lot of accusations, but they were veiled. Um, you know, what I was wearing, who I was with, why didn't I text him back? I didn't text him back right away. Um, when I, this is when I was at my place in Orange. Sometimes he would show up to catch me. I, like that was a pretext for coming over, and by the time by the time we were done talking, would be I, I would have thought I had convinced him that I loved him, that I only loved him, there was no one else, and then that we were back in an upswing and would go back to good, loving, like sick, romantic love, like kind, sweet, velvety love, <laughs> and then it would be. Something I said, why did you say it that way? Um, you know, if I had to leave for an audition, I could guarantee that when I, not couldn't guarantee, but two of those in a row, and when I came back, he was angry at me, you know, and I wouldn't necessarily know why. And then he started accusing me of things, probably, like, at first it was indirect, and then it became really direct. Then the punching uh, of the walls next to my head, was, which is a constant at the, at, at that time in 2012 when he was drinking. Um, eventually that became, uh, uh, you know, him accusing me of cheating. I'd defend myself. I'd say, you know, that's crazy. You're wrong. I would never, the normal things. And uh, it would escalate to the point where he would push me or shove me down and then I'd get back up. And this happened several times. That's why it, it's not more specific, I suppose. It, when I get back up, I'd, I'd, I'd look him in the eye. I made a point of getting up and looking him in the eye. It's my way of defending myself at that time. And I'd look at him, and he'd ask me if I wanted to go again, and shove me back down. Eventually, he just hit me. Uh, remember, he hit me in the face when I denied having an affair with my ex-wife, my ex-partner at the time. Um, and he said he had proof. I denied it. And I was walking out of the bedroom, slapped me across the face. I turned to look at him. And I said, Johnny, you hit me. You just hit me. I'm going to ask you, Michelle, can you bring up 1783, please? What number again, please? I'm sorry, what number? Defendants 1783. 
Do you recognize this picture? Yes, I do. And could you tell us what it is? Uh, it's a picture of my face with um, a note that Johnny left uh, for me by the coffee. Typically, is where we'd leave notes like that. And does this accurately depict the scene portrayed? It was one of those scenes. I. Um, As embarrassing just, as it sounds now, I don't know which scene this came from. There was a lot. It escalated quickly, fast, and it was became. Yeah, well, uh, let, let me ask it a different way. I'm thank just. You. Um, is this a picture of you? Is it a, an accurate picture of you? Yes, Your Honor. I'm going to move the admission of 1783. Your Honor, we have an objection. May we okay, approach? Sure, sure. Uh, Would you please describe for the jury uh, some of the cycles you had with Mr. Depp through 2012? So in 2012, the violence was pretty, you know, relative to what it became, pretty, you know, slapping, uh, backhanding. Well, it went from, it went from this eggshell kind of you're walking on eggshells, nothing you're doing is kind of right, but you don't know what you're doing wrong. Uh, and then I was doing something wrong clearly, but they were, it was unclear within the scope of an argument what I was defending myself against. So it would shift from uh, a rumor he had heard that I was with um, my a friend or I had been photographed standing too close to a male person that was a person I'd have a, and if I had had something with, and I was lying to him about, and the, it would be egg, it would be eggshells, accusations, accusations, and then he would explode. Um, it started with throwing things, um, uh, destroying the property, and screaming at me. I remember the screaming at me was the worst because I kind of always felt like I had done. You know, I had to defend myself. I had to tell him I, so he didn't think these things were true. And sometimes, you know, I, he would shift accusations. While I'm trying to dispel one accusation, he'd start another one. And um, nothing I could do to calm him down, it seemed like. I'd walk away, and that would make it worse. Um, I remember he, in my apartment in Orange, it would he would grab me by the hair or he'd grab me by the arm, face pull me into him, scream at me that way. He'd smash things around me. Then he would smash things very close to me. And then he would just hit me. And it started with slapping. Um, and it got to be like repetitive slaps where he'd hold me um, in a position and slap me multiple times um, in a row. Uh, then it would be you know, eventually I later would either push him off of me or I'd try to hit his hands away from me. I tried to, not in 2012 so much. At that time, I was mostly, um, my defense was, uh, I'd go some other place. Like, I don't, know how, I don't know how to describe that. It was, I'd focus on something else. I'd stand up, look at him, try to stand up to him that way. Uh, later, I adopted other kind of strategies to deal with it, but... At the time in 2012, it was he'd have this blowout, and then he would leave, disappear, and he would. I'd be 
committed to not talking to him. I'm done with this relationship. I can't take it anymore. I said that so many times. And then he'd come back, clean and sober, telling me he had a chip. He didn't have any chips, but he would say, I've, I've gone to meetings. I have a, I have a, a sober companion now. Um, I'm doing this program. I'm reading this. I'm doing this. And he was done with drugs and alcohol for good this time. And he'd come back in my life. And with the combination of him being sober and having gone through this horrible thing where I felt like my heart ripped out of my chest, you know, like a relationship ending is hard, I think, for anyone. But ending under that circumstance is really painful. And so when he'd come back, it would almost feel like a solve, a solution to that. And it would feel great. And we would be good again. And it would be... He'd be extra nice and extra apologetic and extra loving, and it would just, and we'd be back in, in, in the good bubble, the warm glow. And eventually it'd get bored, and then I'd see him drinking again. Um, when I started to get upset, noticing the pattern um, of the violence going with the, the drinking and drugs, then, I, then he started sneaking it. So it became less clear, and I'd have to look for clues as to what he was on, so I just knew how to react, you know? Uh, Johnny on speed is very different from Johnny on opiates. Uh, Johnny on opiates very different from <sighs> Adderall and, 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 and cocaine Johnny, which is very different from Quaaludes Johnny. But I, I had to get good at paying attention to the different versions of him. Uh, 2012, I was in a... Um, I was in the beginning stages of this, just learning these patterns. I was just learning that drinking kind of correlated with the violence. And did you confide in anyone about these issues you were having? I think she Jackson can say. She, I think she can say if she told anybody. As long as she doesn't say what she said. Right. Right. So did you con did you tell anyone? Yes, I did. Who did you tell? I told my therapist. I told. I eventually told my mom. And let's uh, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, Defendant's Exhibit 150. I'm sorry, 150. 150. 150. Your Honor, I'm going to object on hearsay.
why did you decide to confide in your mother about the issues you were having with Mr. Depp? I, th I think I, I felt safe talking to my mom because I knew that she understood these dynamics and she wouldn't judge me for staying with him, for loving him, even though um, this was happening and was happening to me. I knew she would understand. And when approximately did you start confiding in your mom about your issues with Mr. Depp and physical abuse? Objection hearsay compound. I sustain as to compound. When did you start confiding in your mother about the abuse you were, were, were suffering at the hands of Mr. Depp? I, well, I, I was confiding in her from the very beginning about the abuse, the psychological abuse, the kind of control, the disappearing, the not knowing where he was, the then he'd come back and sometimes in the middle of the night, the constant accusations, like that sort of thing. I, I talked to her about probably from the very beginning. Um, the fact that I was secret, I had to hide. Um, I couldn't tell any of my friends that I was with him for a long time because he told me everyone would blame me for the split with him and his partner. So I had to kind of sneak around and kind of get brought to his house, typically in, in a secretive way. And then he'd come to mine in a secretive way. And it was just all very, you know, so very isolating. And uh, I, I confided with her at the very beginning on that sort of thing. And then later opened up to her about some of the violence. I did it gently. You know, um, first I just wanted to have someone to talk to about how scary it was. You know, he is the rage and the the uncontrolled violence, the rage that this man had, and why it Objection, was going to Objection, Your Honor. Be... Hearsay. May we approach? Please? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and take our 15-minute afternoon break, so please do not talk about the case. We're doing the outside research. Okay, we'll see you soon. And Ms. Hurd, just a reminder that now that you're on the stand, you cannot discuss your testimony with anybody to include your attorneys, okay? Cool. All right, so we'll be back. Let's make it 345, okay? Thank you. Thank you.
All right, we're ready for the jury? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, great. Thank you. Please be seated. Your next question. Thank you, Your Honor. Amber, I'm going to take you up to March of 2013. Um, can you describe your relationship with Mr. Depp during that month? And we'll start there. I remember um, that was after a period of a really, some, it was after a period of some peace and then um, he, in sobriety, Johnny was sober, um, drinking Bex. And my uh, dad, uh, who was struggling with alcohol um, and drug addiction at the time, had fallen off the wagon. And, and I remember he said, why don't we send a, I want to send a picture to you to your dad of support, because uh, yeah, my sister was upset with my dad. Um, and so, uh, he poured a shot and, um, and, and, and kind of said, let's take a picture. Uh, I don't, I don't drink spirits, but I, I, I know that, you know, I kind of held up in that picture. It's kind of eerie because I just think it's bizarre. He had broken this long period of sobriety that I thought was going to be the, the end of him drinking forever. I, sounds foolish now, but I, you know, held up this kind of glass with him and we sent the picture to my dad because, you know, I didn't know what else to do. And I remember thinking it was weird that he was drinking. And, um, and then the month got really crazy from that point on. It was, um, a bit of, um, a revolving door of accusations. Uh, he was accusing me of having affairs with, um, well, frankly, just one person I had an, I was an acquaint, I had an acquaintance with somebody and he was accusing me of, of, um, of, of being with them. And then it was accusing me of being with my friend, the one I had seen in Spain. Uh, I, I'm, you know, in these kind of arguments, nothing I do is working. I've, uh, walking out of the room is me leaving him, walking away from me, you know, hey, where are you going? I'm talking to you. That it, it, it went from that to, um, pulling me in by, by my arm, um, still shouting at the, about the accusations. Um, I'm s trying to diffu diffuse the situation by trying to tell him I'm not sleeping with this person and I'm not sleeping with that person. And it was kind of, as soon as it seemed as though I had convinced him of one, there was somebody else he was sure I was sleeping with. Um, and he, he it was a revolving door at that time, um, a painting I had hanging on the wall done by my ex, who's an artist. That was one day he, he was convinced that that was proof I was sleeping with her or having an affair with her. I didn't really love him. And all the while I'm madly in love with him and trying to convince him. So March started with this picture of him doing a shot and he's kind of saying, let's send it to your dad to show support. And what I remember of March is just uh, like an almost, ne it's almost like it was a never ending fight. It was just, there were breaks in it. What kept me in it is beca because I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop, you know, the sobriety shoe, if you will. I kept waiting for him to get to the point where it's not supportable or 
anymore and he's done with it and he's ready to get clean and sober again because there commences a period of like pure joy. And it was one fight after the other, March. So, so let me start with the painting incident. Please tell the jury what happened on that particular incident with the painting. Uh, as I mentioned, the painting which had been hanging there for uh, months, uh, one day he, he kind of stayed up doing cocaine, just drinking, doing cocaine music, which is un not in and of itself that weird in my relationship with Johnny at this point, you know, like he stays up and keeps weird hours and you know, smokes and stuff. But the, the, he was drinking um, brown liquor and doing a lot of cocaine. And it was like, it became clear to me in that argument, if you will, that it was, he wasn't making sense. He had effectively just taken, it seemed like a turn and had decided that the painting was the big, the, an offense that he could not forgive me for. It meant I was having an affair with my ex-partner whom I had already split, with whom I had already split, and it made no sense to me. So I'm, I'm trying to kind of quell the accusations by saying, you know, it's been there, and what are you talking about? And it's like, that doesn't mean anything. And, you know, he was demanding I take it down. He eventually takes it down and tries to burn it, but it was unsuccessful, luckily, because he was not, he, he didn't, he wasn't, <laughs> With a, uh, one of those normal, what do you call it, Bic lighters, he wasn't very successful at doing it while drinking um, to the extent he was. But I remember it was this kind of ridiculous fight, like didn't feel like it needed to be an argument, but it seemed like nothing I could do, nothing I could say. I uh, tried leaving. I um, left the room. I left the house. I eventually came back. It was, it was like a whole night of an evening, a night, and then a morning of this. So this morning in particular, I think it was the like 22nd of, of March. There were several incidents in March though. Um, but in this particular one, he had something to go to. He was filming with Keith Richards and um, uh, Tom Waits. Well, let, let me, before you go into that part, let's, let's pull up uh, Defendant's Exhibit 161 which is already admitted into evidence, I believe, Your Honor. Yes, 161 with redactions. Is Thank you. Evidence. And I'm going to show you Defendant's Exhibit 161. And the date on this is 3-12-2013, and it's a text exchange between you and Mr. Depp. Do you see that? I do. Okay. Um, and the first one is from you to Mr. Depp. Just thought you should know there exists a book. Is that to you? Is it to Mr. Depp from you, or it's vice versa? Isn't um, it? It's Johnny texting me. Just thought you should know there exists a book titled Disco Bloodbath. And then you say, we need that book. And you say, is this about last Friday night by any chance? And he says, how can you make me smile about such a hideous moment? Uh, and I'm not going to repeat the rest of it. Um, could you tell the jury what happened on that Friday night? Um, there were, like I said, there was a few different incidents in March. Um, I believe this one happened in the Eastern Columbia building, which are one of Johnny's penthouses. They're in downtown, so a different part of Los Angeles. And we'd sometimes go there. Uh, I remember he was accusing me again of um, sleeping with this artist, this musician who I'd never slept with. Um, I was denying it. I, I barely knew the person. Uh, and then he was accusing me of, of, of sleeping with my friend in, in Spain. Um, and I, I remember nothing I could do. He like called this person on the phone and screamed at screamed at him. Um, he didn't speak English, so he was really confused as to what he was being yelled at by Johnny. Um, but I remember those were the accusations. That, that was the fight, that, it, but it was one to the next. 
accusation. And I remember I was kind of doing that juggling act. I was in his, one of these fights, I believe it's this one, in his downtown ECB, we call it, um, loft. And we're in the kitchen living room area and he backhands me. And, you know, it was, um, you know, he wears a lot of rings. Uh, I remember kind of just feeling like the, my lip went into my teeth and uh, it got a little blood on the wall. It, just that simple, a little bit of blood on the wall. As hard as it is, as hard as it is to explain this, I, I was so caught up in the relationship and also very occupied in defending what I only as, could assume he believed, these accusations, um, that, you know, I didn't, I didn't internalize, like, I didn't make that big of a deal of it. I'm, you know, I kind of pride myself on being tough and, you know, I don't make a big deal out of, you know, smaller injuries. And I know that sounds horrible because it, and hard maybe to understand, but um, I mean, my best way to cope with it is I kind of, you know, minimize it, make, make, make sure no one, <clears throat> make sure he knows that I'm, I'm tough and can't knock me down and I make a joke of it, clearly. Make light. I'm I going see. to, uh, Michelle, if you can take this one down and um, bring up 170A. Did there come a time in March, Amber, where you sent a picture to your mom? Uh, yes, this is um, sometime in March. Uh, 2013. I just I I sent it to her because I had been texting about some of the craziness and I objection hearsay. I'll, I'll sustain as to what she may have texted. All right, next question. Uh, it, it, without saying what you said in the text, explain why you were sending it to your mom. I was reaching out. Uh, I was very lonely in what I was living in, and I wanted help. I wanted advice, help. It some, I just wanted to talk to somebody okay. and figure out how I could make this stop. And, and is this a picture that you took of yourself in March of 2013? I did. Your Honor, I'm going to move the admission of Defendant's Exhibit 170A. Any objection? No objection, Your All Honor. right, 170A in evidence. You can publish the picture. Thank you, Your Honor. And how did you sustain that bruise, Amber? Um, I was, I had thrown a, um, I, well, I, Johnny slapped me, I walked away from him and that made it worse. We got into a, like a, a shouting match. Um, and he kind of did this thing with his body where I could tell he was gonna hit me again um, I picked up um, like a, I remember it kind of like a, um, like a little pot, not a pot, but um, like a vase. And uh, I, I remember um, I got away from him enough as he reels back, I threw it in his direction and got, actually managed to get away before he got, before he got me. Um, he grabbed me by the arm. Um, and he kind of just held me on the floor, screaming at me. Um, I don't know how many times he hit me in the face, but uh, I, re I remember being on the floor of my apartment. And I'm just, I remember thinking, how could this happen to me again? Can you bring up 170?
Thank you, Michelle. And and if we can, and just for to, to start, it's at three twenty three two thousand thirteen. And if we can scroll scroll up, this is a text message exchange with your mom, correct? Yes, it is. Okay, and let's go. I mean, scroll down and then. Your Honor, I'm going to object to hearsay. Right, let's wait until we get to the spot. All right, and is this the picture that you sent to your mom on 3-23-2013? Yes, it is. Your Honor, I'm going to move the admission of 170 just that, that picture that's on the text. With, with, Along no, with, with no words? Uh, well, it says from two weeks ago no. on it. Your Honor. I'll, I'll sustain the objection. If we redact the from two weeks ago, can we admit it then? And then just have the showing that it, she sent it to her mom. May for we the approach your Okay, sure. All right, 170 will be in evidence with redactions. And may we publish to the jury, please? All right. And that's the picture you sent to your mom? Yes, it is. On March 23rd, 2013. Yes, it was from a previous fight. Okay. The bruise. All right. Now, did you have any other altercations in March 2013 with Mr. Depp? Yes. Um, we had um, we had a couple of these fights in Orange that were around this time, one of which I started to tell you about the painting. You know, and I know I've interrupted you now twice on that, but I realize the jury doesn't. Can you tell them what you mean by orange at orange? Oh. Sorry, orange was my apartment that I kept in Los Angeles at the time. And it was an apartment, what type of an apartment? I rented the top of a duplex. So it was a house um, with the landlord living on the bottom floor. I rented the top floor. Okay, thank you. Now. Please continue with the painting, I'm sorry. Um, I, nothing I could, it seemed like nothing I could say to Johnny would convince him. He wanted me to remove the painting. Um, and he wanted me to admit to this affair that I wasn't having. And I didn't want to admit to it because it's not true. So I held out. And he just started, I mean, he just drank more and did more cocaine. And I woke up the next morning, I think it was on the 22nd or the 23rd. I woke up in the morning and he was, the breakfast table was like cocaine and booze. And I realized that there, that I wasn't going to be able to talk my, like I wasn't going to be able to talk our, 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 our situation down. I wasn't going to be able to talk him out of it and he was just so convinced that I was fighting with him or 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 at the reason that he wouldn't leave the house and he had something to go film that was important and there were important people waiting for him and I remember people were reaching out his assistants his manager sister you know everyone was wondering where he was and I kind of I kept feeling embarrassed and unable to move this person 
out of my house. I couldn't calm him down. I couldn't change. He was just so intent on me admitting the details of this affair that I, I wasn't having. And me pointing out that the cocaine wasn't making his situation any better made me the bad cop. Then I'm the nag. Um, so eventually I called my sister. Uh, he had a kind of a buddy-buddy relationship with her at the time. And at the time, she occasionally did cocaine. I didn't, but she did. And so I was like, hey, come take over. You know, maybe you can buddy-buddy him and talk him into leaving the house, just getting out of the house. And she did. Um, I remember his assistants trying to get him out. Like we, Eventually, in the evening, I think early evening, he finally um, agrees to leave. But I can't tell our relationship status. I can't tell if he still is convinced of these things or if he's just going to sleep it off. And it's going to go back to normal, sobriety, sorry kind of phase. And... Uh, he w w was still upset, but uh, ca like seemingly calming down. So I, I agreed to go with him. He wanted me to go to the to the the shoot. Um, I had plans, so I kind of reluctantly agreed, but didn't want to set anything off. I didn't want to engage anymore. I didn't want to do anything that could be perceived as antagon antagonizing him or engaging more. So I went with him. We grab the dogs, we get in the car, we're on the way there. We're headed up S Sweetser's the street. It's a major street that um, leads up to Johnny's houses. Um, he effectively owns the end of the street. It's like a cul-de-sac. Um, so we're nowhere near his home, but we are driving up this street and uh, he has the window down, he's smoking. Um, it wasn't all the way down but, you know, he's constantly smoking, and at some point he starts howling out of the window and then grabs two small dogs. Well, one was Johnny's dog and one was my dog, but he grabs, if I, if I remember correctly, Boo, the, the, his, his dog, um, slightly chunkier um, teacup Yorkie, and he grabs this teacup Yorkie and holds boo out of the window of the moving car and he's howling like like an animal while holding the dog out of the window and everyone in the car I'll never forget it everyone just froze no one did anything and I, I too was like torn as to what I should do because I didn't want to do anything to cause him to react, drop the dog. You know, it was just this eerie moment where he's howling and holding this animal outside of the, the car window. And more than that weird memory is the, that I have, a, more than that weird memory, I have a memory of everyone just kind of not really reacting to him. Like no one really kind of did anything. They, I eventually kind of pulled his arms gently back into the to the vehicle and kind of got the dog back on the seat and we continued driving, but no one reacted. It just kind of avoided dealing with it. We get to the place, the house where he was filming this thing that he was late for, I suppose for the day. And we walk in Meanwhile, I've been bombarded by text messages and, and calls and conversations with everyone seemingly so stressed about... Objection, hearsay. All right. Just, just don't tell us what somebody else said, just what you observed. I understood everyone was stressed. They seemed stressed to me about the tardiness. Where is he? Let's get him there, you know, so we get him there. And no one reacts when we get in. I mean, we walk into this house where everyone was waiting for him and everyone smiles and says you know hey boss objection hearsay okay so, uh, sorry okay. let's uh, can michelle can we pull up uh, 167a i think we is b b the one that's in 167b is already in right let's 
Oh, it's egg. Okay, then go ahead and pull up egg. Does your honor show that one to be in 167A? D defendants, it's, it's, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, it, this might be your 167A, but it's in evidence as a plaintiff's number, and I'm not sure which plaintiff's number it is. I don't need it in twice, so. I, I would agree. Do we? Your Honor, I don't think it's this version of the photograph that's okay, so been admitted. So, so it's, it's a, a it's different a, version. It's same a different photograph, but a little different. Is that where we're at? It's not the same photograph. Okay, not the All same right, photograph. Well then, then, then we'll go with it. Then what's your, what, okay. what number is it? Do, do you recognize this photo? Yes, I do. Please tell the jury what it is. It's uh, a picture I took of my breakfast table uh, that morning. Your Honor, I'm going to move the admission of Defendant's Exhibit 167A. 167A. Any objection? Your Honor, may we approach? Sure. Sixty-seven A is in evidence. You can publish. So we may we publish that. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. And Amber, you said that you took this that morning. Is that yes. correct? Could you tell the jury what the box is that has the property with the skull bones? Property of JD. Um, that's Johnny's. Um, drug box. I've seen it used for pills, but at the time it was um, bags of Coke, like okay. dime ba bags of Coke. Okay. And what are these white lines on the table to the left of that box? That is cocaine. Okay. Um, and do you know what is in these two glasses that have kind of a gold colored, colored liquor? Uh, yes. They're different, actually. It's confusing. They're different. Um, Different liquids. Uh, the one in the back in the larger glass is, um, I, I believe at the time I um, was doing these tabs, or Barocca, that's what they're called, they're little tablets. And um, anyway, uh, I remember at the time that that's what I was putting in my water because I had just come back from France where they sell them. And then the brown liquid in the shot glass is um, Johnny's liquor. I don't know what it's called, but it, we kept it in the freezer. At the time, it was bef, bef, you know, at that time, March 2013, I hadn't, you know, um, I still didn't have the, you know, hard line, I won't even keep that, you know, in my freezer sort of attitude or posture with him. I wasn't that bold at the time, you know, I didn't like it, but I didn't have that strength. I kind of, at that time, I think was doing things like trying to pour it out when I could. So um, what is the bag, the brown bag on the left side? What is that? Uh, that's um, a dop kit. It's um, like, you know, his prescriptions and um, cigarette, tobacco, weed, things that, like that. Okay, and then ab above it there appears to be a, a CD of some sort, a DVD something. Do you recognize that? Yes, it's um, the single, I, I, I believe it's what it's called, the single he was making at the time. I think that's the song that they were filming a video for, if I'm correct. Okay. All right. Now, did you end up sending a copy of this picture to Rocky Pennington that day? I did. I sent it to my best friend at the time, and, you know, it was like, Look at my morning. Objection. Like, hearsay. Okay, you can't say what you said, but you sent it to your friend, correct? Mm -hmm. Let's go to, to 167, friend. please. And is that the email in which you sent this picture to Rocky Pennington on 322? Yes. 2013? Your Honor, I'd like to move the admission of the picture with the redaction of the message on it, 
uh, with the top with identifier redactions and we take out the rest of it. Uh, all right, any objection? No objection. All right, so either those redactions, 167 and evidence with redactions. All right, and may we publish, please? All right, and is this the text message, the email that you sent to Rocky with this picture? Yes. Okay. Now I'm going to take you to Let's go to Hicksville. Let's tell the jury about Hicksville, May 2013. Can you tell the jury what transpired at Hicksville? Uh, it is a, it's a, like a fancy um, trailer park, like a little hotel in the middle of nowhere, um, set up with these little trailers and uh, we had made a, a, a plan to go there with friends, and um, we were going to do, you know, like laffy, as we said, laffy drugs, like mushrooms, eat mushrooms, sit by a campfire. Um, it, there's really not a whole lot else to do out there. It's like a getaway. Um, we had made this plan, uh, and it was going fine. It was like a you know, kind of like a party out in the desert um, with a few friends and campfire and music. And um, I, I don't know who brought, somebody brought MDMA, um, was being passed around and somebody who, who took it um, kind of was starting to feel the effects of it, I guess is the best way to describe. She kind of reacted in this way where when the MDMA hit her, she kind of you know, we were sitting around a campfire, all of us, and she kind of just leaned into me and put her, you know, head on my shoulder and kind of grabbed my arm. I took it, you know, to be the effects of the drug. Um, and uh, I think I had eaten a, a mushroom cap, um, but was not feeling anything at the time. Um, I don't remember feeling anything. Um, because the night just kind of changed pretty dramatically um, before I really felt anything of the effects of that. But that was the environment we were in. And, um, and as soon as she kind of did this thing where she leaned into me, um, Johnny um, gets really activated he gets really upset and he starts well at first it, it, she thought he was kidding too I, she thought he was kind of making a joke I think we all did everyone kind of responded at first you know that, that it, like it was a joke but he, he was like um, hey man what are you doing you know what do, what do you what do you think you're doing and she kind of giggled and kind of leaned into me more and I knew in my body just instantly that it wasn't a joke um, but she didn't so she's kind of still attached to my arm when he says it again to her louder. He says, hey man, you think you're touching my fucking girl? You think you're touching my fucking girl? That's my fucking girl. And he gets louder and louder. And she kind of did this thing half understanding what was going on. I think she kind of started to cry at this point, but she kind of threw up her hands and Johnny grabbed her, her wrist and kind of twisted it. And pulled her into him and said, do you know how many pounds of pressure it takes to break a human wrist? Huh? And he kind of held her and she just, she just looked frozen. And uh, she's crying and she was just denying, understanding what was going on. I stepped in. I kind of take Johnny's arm around, kind of, take Johnny's hand and kind of we start 
communicating. I don't remember if he immediately was accusing me or if it was sometime after. I wish I remembered, but we we agreed that we'd go and talk about it in the trailer. Uh, so we walked to the trailer, um, and when we're in the trailer, Johnny, by the time we get into the trailer, Johnny tells me that I um, had been instigating the, uh, uh, like, you know, in asking for this and that I had invited it and that I, I hadn't been honest with him about my relationship with this woman. And not to, I didn't really know her that well. I mean, I actually don't know her at all, but I had met her. And I remember in the trailer, um, he's accusing me of, of lying about it and that I, you know, that I had something with her. I'm trying to diffuse that. I'm trying to calm him down. And um, he just turned all that, um, it seemed like he turned all that rage onto the trailer itself. And he just started smashing things. Um, he picked up something on the table and threw it right into the glass cabinet. Um, he hit with his hand um, a, a wall sconce. Um, he cleared the tabletop on the little fold down um, like kitchen, dining room area in this trailer. I mean, it's a trailer, so there's only so much you can do. And he's screaming at me, just screaming at me. Um, and I, I, I uh, eventually go back into the back, the bedroom area. Uh, he comes into the bedroom area. We had what I can only describe as um, a, uh, uh, it sounded like nonsense from him. It wasn't making sense. And I realized that he's just probably really high um, because it wasn't making sense anymore. It wasn't like a direct accusation. I wasn't, he wasn't hearing me when I was saying, I, 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 I wasn't involved, wasn't cheating on him. I wasn't secretly trying to engage this woman in some sort of sexual affair. Um, and, and then it became clear to me, he was like looking for something. He um, cleared things off the bed. I went into the bathroom and as I come out, um, he's at, he asked me where it is and how long I've been hiding it. And I, was, I was like, what are you talking about? And he says, you know what I'm fucking talking about. You know what I'm fucking talking about. Be honest with me. Where are you hiding it? And he kind of like makes to look into the bathroom. Um, and I gestured to the bathroom, which was to my right. I kind of like gestured to him and I said, like, what? What am I, where am I gonna, what am I hiding and where am I gonna hide it? And, and we're standing in this little hallway area outside of the bathroom and he starts, you know, pat, pat, what it feels like patting me down or saying he's patting me down, I can't recall, but he ripped my dress, the uh, strap top part of my dress. I had just dyed this thing um, myself, pink. And it's just one of those things I, <laughs> I was like, you know, that's my, I just finished that dress. And um, he's like grabbing my, my, my breasts. He's touching my thighs. Um, he rips my underwear off. Um, and then he, he, he proceeds to do a cavity search. He was looking, he said he was looking for his drugs, his cocaine, his coke. I was wondering how I, somebody who didn't do cocaine and was against it, that was in and of itself causing problems in our relationship. How could I hide, why would I hide his drugs from, like, I, like he was insinuating that I was doing it or something? It made no sense. And he was telling me we're doing we're gonna we're gonna conduct a cavity search shall we <sighs> like just shoved his fingers inside me <sighs> now, I, just, just just stood there 
I'm staring at the stupid light. I didn't know what to, you know, I didn't know what to do. I just stood it I just stood there while he did that. He twisted his fingers around. I, I don't I didn't say like stop or anything. I just So the next morning, um, what tr what transpired? I remember thinking that Johnny would change his mind, um, and it would be. Um, yeah, I thought it would end differently. I, I kind of froze. I don't know how we went to bed that night. I don't know how I went to bed. I don't know how I slept. I don't know how we woke up. I don't remember having a conversation with him the next day. I don't remember talking to him about it or confronting him about it. I, I remember wanting it to be okay. I remember just wanting whatever fucking weird trip, excuse me, whatever trip that was to end you know just to be over and for it to just go back to normal um and I remember my friends were out by the pool like the, the there was a pool in the center of the trailer park and I remember putting on my you know just putting on my base and going back into this like crap you know and the, and I remember seeing my friends by the pool thinking they were just having a great time and no one knew what was, you know, I felt so lonely. Like no one knows what's, everyone was just having a good time, you know, like normal stuff. So I just smiled and made a joke about how trash the trailer got and we had to get the manager uh, who started off furious that Johnny had wrecked the thing. And then he had this like black mesh tank top, not tank top, but it was like a meshy kind of shirt on. And I remember he came into the trailer and looked around and was like, whoa, what happened here? Whoa. And Johnny had an exchange with him. And I remember wa watching this man be so charmed. It was just a kind of a surreal experience. And, you know, it just went away. You know, that just got fixed. We walked out of the trailer at some point. My dog stepped on a bee. <laughs> We went to the bet and went on with our, you know, vacation. We actually went to another location after that and then eventually went home and went about our life. I'm going to ask you to take a look. Michelle, can you bring up Defendant's Exhibit 176? Did there come a time that you wrote an email? Objection, leading, and hearsay, Your Honor. May we approach? All right. In June 2013, how were you feeling about your relationship with Mr. Depp? 
Okay, we have the exhibit taken away okay, from you. Sure. Thank you. I, um, by June, I was so torn. I was so in love with this person because when it was good, it was so good. You've never felt love like that. At least that's how it felt. <laughs> so much. I felt like he recognized me and I recognized him and there was just something there that that is the love of my life. And he was. He was. But he was also this other thing. He was also this other thing. And that other thing was awful. Awful thing that would come out and take over and it was you couldn't see the Johnny I loved underneath it it was this other thing and no one told him no one was honest with him no one you know he'd pass out in his own vomit he'd lose control of his body his you know he'd lose control and everyone would clean up after him I cleaned up after him I mean, this man lost control of his bowels and I cleaned up after him. His, his, his security cleaned up after him, changed his pants in front of me. He would pass out in his own sick. You know, and then he'd walk around saying he didn't have a problem. Until he did. Until he couldn't support it anymore and he'd get clean and he'd get sober and then he was this thing again. This thing that made me feel so loved, that made me feel like... <sighs> like my... Like my soulmate, as cheesy as that sounds, I just felt like he knew me. And I recognized something in him, either some part of my makeup and my background or something that I just got it. And I loved him and understood him. It, it just got so scary, the other part of him. And in June, I wanted, I wanted to leave him. I wanted to, I didn't want to leave him. I, I wanted to want to leave him. I wanted him to get better. And he expressed to me so many times when he was in that period of getting clean and sober, he would tell me, you saved my life. Baby girl, you saved my life. Everyone else was saying that to me and I believed it. You know, if it, everyone else was saying it, he was saying it. I thought, just like his other friends who had gotten clean and sober and stayed that way, his older friends, these rock stars that he hung out with that had like gotten clean and sober and they had 20, 30 years, something, you know, I thought, and Johnny told me he w would be that person, that he was going to be that person, and I believed it. I had so much, I looked at that man twice my age, you know, I was 25, looking at this man twice my age, and I saw hope and, like, promise. I had so much hope, you know, the whole thing. Kids and growing old together, sort of hope. If it was just for this one thing that he could do, which would save his life, which would be to get clean and sober. And I believed it. And I wrote this letter to myself, among many letters to myself. Objection, because I say. All she did was refer to that she wrote it. She isn't saying what she said. I'll no rule for that. Thank point. you. Okay. I wrote that letter because I thought it would be read to him, I could read it to him, I could say it to him in intervention, you know, in help, and he would, he would later thank me for, as he did, as he used to thank me all the time for saving his life, just, I. Did there come a time later in June that you finally met Johnny's kids? 
I, um, I finally met them in the summer of 2013. I had been with Johnny for over a year, maybe like a year and a half at this point, is my best guess. And I was dying to meet them, you know, dying to get to know these kids. I felt like I knew them already. Uh, I had his daughters, uh, and actually, and Jack's, it, both, both of his kids' art on my fridge, and I had never even met them. You know, Johnny had brought them over one day and kindly given them to me, and I had them up on my fridge because I felt like I knew them, just how much he talked about them. And I finally got to meet them um, at the Lone Ranger premiere at Disneyland, uh, yeah, summer 2013. So then I'm going to jump to and, and it's not much of a jump to june 26 2013 um there was a plane ride to russia with johnny do you recall that yes well, tell the jury about that particular event oh uh, well that was the first and last time i ever um <laughs> decided it would be a a decent idea to do drugs with johnny um i did mdma with or did MDMA with him on the plane, which was as stupid as it may sound. Um, I just had never, I was very against, obviously the cocaine had been a, a problem. I was very much against him using cocaine. I was against the drinking, supportive of the sobriety, I, you know, but I'm 26 maybe uh, ish. And I, I wanted, you know, I had never heard of anyone making MDMA uh, like what I had, I had done MDMA before, you know, I thought it's a lovey drug. It's a, you know, it's like a kind of, I never knew anyone to uh, get violent on it. And, um, you know, I thought, well, this is a relatively contained environment. But maybe this will be different. Maybe I can be a good cop and be part of the, you know, like I don't have to be the lesbian counselor all the time, as you would say. You know, I can maybe be the fun girlfriend. And I learned the hard way that that was not happening. <laughs> um, so what happened? Well, we took um, we took MDMA. I took a, a capsule. Um, it's like a powder in a capsule. I took a capsule and Johnny took uh, several. I didn't count, but um, you know it's very different when you see someone take one versus a handful of something. But nothing seemed to set any alarm bells off, and it, things were going fine until um, until the flight attendant got involved. The flight attendant came by, was engaging with us. Uh, I, I don't think that they're really, it felt like it was before the effects of the drug um, took over, it was, so it was relatively quick, soon after we first took our dose, if you can say, and the flight attendant, um, Johnny offered her some, she of course said no, and then after some back and forth between them, Johnny convinced her that it would be fine, so she acquiesced and took uh, MDMA with us. It's and within you know a few minutes go by, and she, the the same thing happened um, that happened on the mushrooms uh, at Hicksville uh, with the woman Kelly Sue, who I've told you about. Uh, flight attendant got friendly with me, but just friendly, just like MDMA friendly. You know, was kind of I'm a woman, he's a man, so she was naturally, I think, more comfortable with me physically. She kind of leaned into me and kind of sat on the arm of the chair I was sitting in. I mean, after all, she, she's on drugs, and um, Johnny uh, grabs, grabs her hand and tells her not to touch me, and she kind of reacts um, in a way, uh, like, you know, like she's defending herself and was trying to clar clarify, and... Um, he grabbed her by the wrist and slammed it down on the table 
and told her he could break her wrist. And I remember thinking, I've heard this before. And that was a pattern that would repeat itself a few times. These things would happen in these kind of cycles where there would be a certain element that would get filtered for a while, whether it's an accusation or a gesture, and that would be the thing that he looped on. I called it looped, loops. And he grabs her wrist and he tells her he could break her wrist. She cries instantly, denies it, is so apologetic. Go, eventually, he lets go. She goes to the front of the plane where the flight attendant you know, normally hangs out and the doors close. And I don't see her much of that whole flight. <clears throat> uh, we land in Russia and I don't really remember you know, any, there was, I don't recall any violence on the plane um, between Johnny and I, but I remember feeling this tension because I was wondering when uh, it was going to aim at me because he had this particular thing about, well, at the time I understood he had a particular thing, a sensitivity about me and women because I had had a female partner. So I, I was feeling nervous anxious and um, I remember we had a very quiet ride at least I didn't say anything um, to the ride to the hotel and almost as soon as we get into the hotel room um, Johnny's accusing me of effectively having um, en engaged that uh, ca caused that um, I of course deny it uh, point out what I thought was obvious that, you know, like we'd, we'd given her drugs, you know, it's wasn't an affair, wasn't, you know, and I'm trying to argue and defend myself at the same time. And um, at one point, Johnny just shoves me like, I mean, just shoves, shoves me hard. And I fall back onto this glass table. Um, I catch myself on the table. Um, I don't know how, some furniture got knocked around. There was a, you know, I, I, I'm trying to stand up for myself. I'm trying to stand up, literally. I'm not, you know, at this point, I don't even try to hit back or try to run. I'm in this hotel room trying to do my best to fight mostly the verbal accusations, but also I try to stay on my feet, you know. Um, at some point, uh, Johnny whacks me in the face. And I don't even, I don't remember feeling pain or like awareness of my nose or anything. I just, I don't remember thinking that. I remember kind of crying and feeling, I went into the bathroom and I, I wanted him to have a, like, I, I, I just remember wanting him to realize what had happened. I wanted him to kind of snap out of it. I wanted him to care. I wanted him to realize what was going on because a big part of this, I felt like he wasn't aware. There was this sense that he didn't know what was going on. You know, again, I don't know how much of the drugs or alcohol is a part of this, but I remember crying. I came out at some point because I don't hear him in that room. I remember we had been arguing in the main room, but I went out to the hallway, which is where I presume he walked out, and his bodyguard, Jerry Judge, was in the hall. And I don't recall seeing Johnny in the hallway, but I remember seeing Jerry Judge, who... Um, gesture to Objection, my nose. hearsay. She's just saying gesture. He hasn't said anything yet. All right, uh, gesture's fine. I'll overrule the objection. Um, he gestures to my nose um, and holds out his um, handkerchief, like a cloth handkerchief. Uh, and I instantly felt, just felt really embarrassed. Do you, I felt like I felt ashamed. I, I don't know how else to describe it. I just felt like just really embarrassing. And I went inside the, the room. What, if any, inner injury did you have? I had a little blood coming out of my nose. Uh, I didn't know it. I didn't feel it at the time until Jerry gave me the – Jerry let me know. Okay. And I went inside the um, the hotel room and uh, – it. As embarrassing as it is, I, I, um, I, I remember uh, just wanting. I remember just wanting Johnny to 
say sorry. I wanted him to realize it. It's so stupid, but I like the emotional part. You know, I just wanted him to acknowledge that this was um, that he like he could hurt me, you know, and I wanted it to be okay. I didn't want him to think I was interested in this flight attendant. I didn't want him to think that I would capable of cheating on him. I was in love with him. I wanted, you know, I just wanted things to be okay. Let's take you to July 9, 2013. Did there come a time that you went for a ride on, you went to the Bahamas and went on a ride on the yacht with Johnny and his kids? Well, it's less like a, we flew out to the Bahamas to his island. Um, he was selling the yacht to JK Rowling and he wanted to kind of have a goodbye trip on the yacht. So it was docked uh, off the island, and I went with him and his uh, kids, who I had quickly developed a bond with and loved. And we brought a friend uh, along with us, I think, to kind of help. And yeah. Okay. T tell, tell the jury what happened on that trip. Johnny was uh, upset that he had to sell the boat. Uh, and he was uh, off the wagon again, but he didn't want to tell his kids, so he was hiding it from them. Uh, he was putting it in um, coffee cups and drinking, and the behavior just kind of like, he was upset, he was emotional, and it just, he just, you know, that's how he dealt with it, just drink. But there's just no off button with Johnny. So he just kept drinking, and the behavior kept getting more obviously drunk. And Lily Rose, his daughter at the time, was young, just like maybe 14. And she started to um, get panicky and asked, started to ask me questions about his drinking. Objection hearsay. Without uh, saying what Lily Rose was saying, please continue on. Um, Sustained the objection. Thank you. So she was asking me questions about the drinking. Um, and was very upset. Sustain the objection. Yeah, you, you yeah. can't say what Lily Rose said. Oh, but yeah. you can you can tell gestures. Sorry. You can tell, and you can say what you and Mr. Depp said. Okay. Sorry. Um, so she was upset, and uh, Johnny kind of we were with the kids, and he kind of threw himself off the boat in a half playful way, um, like a dead. He like dead fish kind of way. I don't know how to describe it. Almost like a belly flop. But we were on a skip, like a, a smaller boat parked next to the yacht. And he's jumping. Well, he jumped off the front of it, but kind of in a, a face chest forward way. Like it, it looked a little scary, like not something somebody would do if they're completely OK. You know, it was it, it was started off all of us kind of taking turns jumping off the edge of the yacht uh, into the water and then he at one point kind of throws himself over and it looked a little scary um, the way his body fell into the water and Lily Rose um, started to cry and expressed to me that she Objection here was upset. Objection here sustained. You, you can't say what she said. You can say, you can tell expressions or observations, but you can't say what Lily Rose said. So okay. Lily Rose is crying, and the crying becomes like a, like a panic, like, like almost like a panic attack, uh, it, it, like rapid breathing, crying, lots of questions. And I'm holding her, kind of comforting her, and Johnny comes in. And within a few, um, within a few seconds, I realize that he, you know, kind of shifted his attention on me. And then he, he seemed very angry. Uh, he asked Lily Rose to leave. Lily Rose leaves, looks at me, leaves crying, and Johnny in uh, I don't remember the words he used but starts accusing me of kind of like telling on him and calling him um uh you know a drunk in front of his kids I hadn't I hadn't done that I was actually trying to protect Johnny uh 
I wasn't, it didn't feel like my place at all to share that with, with his daughter or, or anyone um, at the time other than adults who might help with it, but not his kids. So I was trying to tell him, I'm, I was just trying to comfort her. I was trying to protect you. He uh, basically was accusing me of doing this thing and of, of making them aware of his, uh, that he was drinking again. And he slams me up against the, the sidewall of the bedroom of the, we were in the bedroom this whole time, but up against the wall of the cabin and slams me up by my neck and holds me there for a second and tells me that he, he could fucking kill me. And that was an embarrassment. I was embarrassing. It was an embarrassment. This whole thing was a joke. It was all embarrassment. I made him feel sick. And I'll, ne I'll never forget. I'm, 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 I was I'm very, very, very much in love with this whole family now. And he's saying I'm embarrassing to him. And that somehow stuck in, in, in me more than the, I could fucking kill you. It just sounded like hyperbole. It sounded like something he was just saying, but the, the names that he was calling me were kind of just pushing me up against the wall by my neck. You know, it hurt, hurt my feelings, it hurt. Um, I, uh, when I communicated with, when I saw Lily Rose again, we get, uh, I won't say w what she told me, but the next thing we do is we call for uh, a helicopter to come and take us off of the um, boat or off of the island. So we leave the boat, go to the landing um, of, a, a, of a part of the island, or maybe it was a different you know, island we had to get to to leave, and we we take off. I'm holding Lily Rose in my, un, literally holding her under my arm while she's crying, and we're lifting off. And Jack ended up not coming with us at the last minute. He stayed behind, um, and we were taking off. And I, rem I remember being really torn about leaving. I, I, I felt bad about leaving, even though that 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 had happened. I, I still felt awful leaving. I felt awful leaving him. I, 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 I also felt like I had done something wrong. You know, he, like he was mad at me. I wasn't sure, you know, where, what I had done, but I, I remember not being, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting all these text messages from him calling me all these names and it barely coherent, barely. And I'm holding his daughter crying. And let me just stop you for a moment. Michelle, can you pick Pull up Defendant's Exhibit 180. Do you believe that's already in evidence? It is already in evidence, Your Honor, All so right. if we may we'll publish it to it. the jury. And Amber, I'm going to ask you to take a look at 180. And this is text messages from Mr. Depp to you. Do you recall these? Yes, I do. And and. Are these the text messages? Yes, that's what he was sending me while I was taking care of his daughter. Your Honor, I'm about to go into another event. Should I keep going? I mean, that, that's fine if you think this is a good point to, to break for the day. Okay. I think it's probably a good point. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll go ahead and conclude for today. Again, do not do, read anything about this case. Do not do any outside research and don't discuss it with anybody, okay? Have a good evening. We'll see you in the morning, okay? Thank you.